it's an honor to be speaking here at Parallel Polis. Um, this place, I think, is, um, shows us some inspirational models about how we as a community can be organized together and how we can approach things differently than what society tells us. Um, when I first started to come to conferences in 2018 um, uh, and came across this place, this is you know, kind of what I've been looking for for quite some time, somewhere that kind of articulated a bit clearer that, um, that you know, it wasn't just going to be Bitcoin, it wasn't just going to be software and money that solved our problems, that you know, human beings aren't that simple, and that um, you know, the, if we are to navigate out of the, um, the, the bad situation that we are in some ways, that it's going to come from a deep understanding of how technology and humanity can work together. And, you know, I feel like uh, when I first came across this place and started watching some videos from uh, Smuggler and Frank Brown and Paul Rosenberg and people like that, you know, this is kind of um, highlight of that. So, so, yeah, it's an honor to be speaking here. Um, Pizza Day last year was a really, really good conference. It's an honor to be speaking at it this year, and I hope that it continues for many more years to come. And the origin of this talk actually started um, or came from when I started watching some of those videos um, from earlier Hackers' Congresses. Um, and uh, exploring some ideas or thinking more deeply about like how uh, society and uh, humanity and technology, specifically Bitcoin, all mesh together. Um, so last year, um, just before I gave my talk at Honey Badger, I started working on a, a different talk about you know based on some of these things that have been stewing in my mind for a for a year or two. And um, at the um, the beefsteak for the Honey Badger conference, I was actually talking to Eric Syrian. Um, uh, about about the same topic about parallel polis and Hackers Congress, and you know we were both sharing our stories about how we both really got a lot from these guys' talks, and um, you know I was giving Eric a bit of stick as we do from us from the antipodes often do. You're giving a bit of banter and saying, oh you know you just stole uh, Fediment from um, Smuggler and Frank Brown's project Script, didn't you? And he's like, well <laughs> it wasn't quite like that. You know they were both working on the same idea at the same time, um, but. Not just that, that um, Smuggler and uh, Frank, they didn't really have the intention to build out Squid into this fully-fledged thing that really worked. It was just like a prototype, you know. None of the work that Eric's gone ahead and done with Fenimans. Um He said, you know, the, he spoke to them about it, and they said, well, you know, it was more like just trying to remind the, the broader decentralized uh, cryptocurrency space, if you like, about some principles that uh, used to exist in the cyberpunk world that had been lost, that... For them, it was almost like performance art, which was cool because that was kind of the, the working title I have for the story and uh, sorry for the speech that I'm about to give today. So, um, you know, what inspired me to become a, a software developer um, was when I went to uh, building on Bitcoin in Lisbon in 2018, and at the time, then I was not a software developer. Um, and at that conference, uh, Adam Fiskor presented Wasabi, and Nicolas Dorier presented uh, BDC Pay Server. And um, you know, up to that point, I thought if you had, to, if you're working on software with Bitcoin, you had to be some sort of computer genius, like Luke Dasher or Peter Willer or someone like that. You know, that it was all very deep protocol level sort of stuff. Um, and what I realized was the power that was available at the app level. Like these guys were, they were definitely competent developers, but they weren't these like supercomputer geniuses. They just had a vision for what Bitcoin could be or, or should be. And uh, they wrote some software that kind of explained to the world or showed to the world that vision of what they have for Bitcoin, about ways that you could use it um, and how it could be, um, you know, some of the freedoms that it could give you that people weren't familiar with that were available um, in the protocol. And that kind of blew my mind because, um, you know, what it, with a penny dropped for me in that moment that, you know, I kind of realized that, like, um, software development is almost like art in a sense like that, that, you know, you take a medium and you impose some restrictions or stylistic variations or what have you on it, and you kind of use that as a way to tell a story or share a vision with the world about how things could be different. Um, so, you know, that really, really blew my mind, and that was what encouraged me to become a software developer and kind of in many ways led me to be here in front of you today. Um, but it's a bit of a weird idea, right? Like, software is art, right? You know, we, we think software is this tool that we use to get things done in a more efficient manner rather than the stuff we talk about while sipping over priced wine at some expensive party, right? So it would probably benefit if I'm going to go down this road to explain kind of what art actually is. And that's obviously notoriously quite a hard thing to do. But if you ask me what I think art is, is art is really at its kind of deepest level, it's communication, right? You know, uh, same way with words and speech, you know, you have something inside your mind that you want to share with the world around you, that you want to get out to express yourself, or that you want to communicate to other people to influence the way th they think about things or to share an idea. And art's just another way of doing that um, that, that you know, it's the same as speech or writing or things like that. 
But also, iron also has many different properties to those ones there about where it can be much more suitable for certain messages. Like, you know, there's that saying, obviously, a picture paints a thousand words. There are certain things that you can say with art which are just way too hard or almost impossible to say with, um, with speech and writing that you can say in an instant with a good piece of art, right? So it's a way to communicate a message that words or speech is not that well suited to, and generally that's messages that are more of an emotional nature, or like speaking from the heart, if you like. Um, the, the other one that art is really, really good for is communicating like a vision for the future, right? And the, and the beauty of art is that um, you can kind of uh, lead people up to a point. You can steer a compass in a direction of what they're thinking, but you don't actually have to give them the answer. And the beauty of art is that you can communicate a message, but you can leave it up to the, the viewer or the consumer to kind of fill in the blanks of what that ultimate end is. And so it's almost like a collaborative way that you can communicate to people without telling them, and they can suggest and you know, have that vision for what the future is. Um, but um, because of that, it, it's no surprise that if you look at um, a lot of the changes that happen in society, they often come from artists and cultural producers, and especially if you look at like um, uh, societies, oppressed societies, you know, where there's uh, dictatorial regimes or some such, it's always, um, there's always a very strong presence of artists in the resistance movement, right? Because, you know, they see, uh, or the uh, resistance movement sees the power of art to influence social change. And this is a very important role that art plays in society, right? So we'd all be familiar that you, know, you have top-down power, right? You have these people like the elites, the governments and corporations, right? That have money, they have power, they have the megaphone. And they're able to use things like laws, um, changes in you know, the, the way that their software works, regulations, mass marketing, things like this. They use that to influence society, like they exert what's called top-down power. And the influence for these guys, where they get their ideas about where they should steer society, what the principles behind all these things should be, come from these guys there on the um, right-hand side, left-hand side. Um, experts, think, think tanks, lobbyists, people like the WEF, et cetera, you know, these guys um, suggest to the governments about what their smart idea for future policy might be, and they create these things, and therefore they influence society and the masses below them through the use of these tools. But power is also exerted in the opposite direction, from the ground up. You know, from the masses. You know, people can, obviously the most obvious way that we'd all know in, in a democratic society is through voting. You know, the, the masses can uh, get their information out and influence the direction that society and government takes. But it can also be things like, you know, selective disobedience, protests, or even revolution, you know, if you really go down the scale there. So, you know, the masses can, ex can exert force on the direction of society and the direction of government as well. And the inspiration for these guys is this, this other group here on this, um, the left, bottom side, that's um, artists and activists. And generally, you know, these are the people that drive social change and inspire people to lead uh, kind of grassroot mo grassroots movements or bottom-up change. They are artists and activists. You know, they, they generally have a very strong emotional message, and that changes the, you know, the, the, the um, spur of the age, if you like, for the people. And through that influence, the people uh, influence and power up and influence governments. And you can only look at, um, you only need to look at things that were in the 80s or 90s that were illegal or considered very immoral or um, kind of out there that now are very accepted and very normal and predicted under law. There are you know, examples of things, and if you go back and look at it, you know, the, the, the change where the, um, the seed was sown about changing societal uh, opinions about these things, it's always come from artists and from activists. So art um, is a way to um, communicate, just like words or writing. It's a way to uh, communicate a message, if you like, like from the soul or from the heart that um, words or writing are not that effective at doing, but art is much more effective at. It's a vehicle to create social change, like we looked at here, about the way that the, uh, the masses, the people at the bottom, can exert power up and, um, and change the world around them. Um, and it's also a means of communication, as I mentioned, that's very well tuned into um, imagination and, and visioning how the world could be different. And in fact, um, you know, they call art, they have called art, um, storytelling or storytelling through objects. And um, storytelling is a very important and key part of our culture and our technology. It's something that's common to all cultures and civilizations all around the world. Um, it's, a, it's a key way to impart information and share stuff around. And that's because it's a very effective way of sharing information because it involves emotion and it involves all the senses, right? If I was to tell you um, a story of there's a place here called Bordel, don't go downstairs because there's a scary guy called Mario who's going to trap you. That's going to be nowhere as effective if I tell you the story about the time I was here and my cousin was abducted by this guy called Mario and 
fed uh, inebriating, intoxicating substances and made to listen to German techno for 14 hours, along with Richard Stallman lectures and wouldn't allow him to leave unless he wrote uh, Cypherpunk Future is now a thousand times on the whiteboard. So when we tell a story, uh, it's been scientifically proven it's up to 22 times more effective in engaging our memory and getting us to retain and act on that information. So stories are very effective ways uh, to get people to do things. Um, but also, stories are a key part of how we uh, understand the world around us. In 1944, they did this study where um, they showed people this uh, video, and it's a video on the screen behind me right now. And what it is, is basically a couple of triangles in a circle moving around on a, a flat screen with a rectangle in the middle of it. And they asked these people who watched this video, they said, you know, what happened after this? Now, only one person said that what they had seen was a bunch of ge geometric shapes moving around a, a screen. Everyone else had these elaborate narratives about what had gone on. You know, the, the, the triangle and the um, small triangle and the circle, they were innocent little things. And the big triangle was this bad guy out to get them who was blinded by rage and frustration. Because, you know, as human beings, we can't help but tell ourselves stories and see stories and things. They're, they're a key technology, technology, social technology that we use to make sense of the world around us. Just in the same way that we will see um, fam uh, familiar patterns or shapes or faces visually, or we'll uh, our ears will catch a familiar tune or a, uh, a tone of voice or a bird sound or something like that, we also see, use t stories as a way to see patterns and in information, right? So stories are a way that we make sense of the world around us, and it's something that human beings can't help to do. Um, and that's, that's important because, you know, this has real consequences for the way that we our actions and the way that we see the world, we interact with the world. You know, the stories that we are told are these kind of um, Hollywood blockbuster stories, you know, black and white things about the battle between good and evil. When you have a politician talk about the axis of evil, well, that makes sense because this rings true with the story that we've been told and we believe this person. But of course, you know, the reality is quite different. For example, if you were to look at some like 9-11, one of these guys would tell that the story was that a bunch of people were radicalized and, and uh, put on a path of hate. And the other one would say that you know, these people found Allah's true path. So when we have like a, a catastrophic event like this, right, we ask ourselves, why did this happen? Why did this person do this thing? And what we are really looking for is something along the lines of, oh, well, these guys were brainwashed by these preachers and, and led to, to hate the West, and that's why they acted while they did. Or something like, you know, they heard the, the call of Allah to be a martyr, and that's why they acted what they did. You know, we, we don't want facts. What people look for in the aftermath of this stuff to make sense of the world around them is stories. And those stories and how we tell ourselves, what we tell ourselves, have dramatic impact for the actions that we take. For example, one of these people, the story that they would tell themselves is, well, we got sloppy, and so what we need to do is increase immigration, make things more strict, and go militarily intervene in the Middle East. The other one would say something like, well, you know, what happened happened because they were um, these, uh, against all odds, these guys were acting in, in line with the will of Allah, and so he blinded the intelligence agencies to their actions, and that's how they were able to succeed against all odds. So, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves, again, have massive implications about what transpires in the actions that we take in the real world. And the real power of... Um, of art is that it allows us to tell these stories, right? It is a vehicle that we can create our own narratives and we can share them with the world around us and influence people through the power of art to create emotionally engaging stories, right? Through art, influence the world around us. So that's, that's stories, that's art, but like how does this relate to software, right? That's a bit of a stretch when you think, right? Like that software can be art. Well, I've got four examples here of, that I think practically show how this works in, in society. The first one is the stone virus. Has anyone here had the experience that they booted up their 286 and saw this message show up on the screen? Maybe I'm kind of showing my age here saying that. Um, the stone virus was like one of the first viruses to ever get out in the, in the world, right? And how this spread was you had an infected floppy disk, you put it in your computer, it would copy itself into the master boot record of your computer, and then uh, from there, any computer disks that were inserted into your computer it would copy itself onto the master boot record of them, and then when you put one of these disks in another computer, it would spread like this, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the virus itself is a pretty benign kind of thing, right? All that this thing did is if there was a 12.5% chance that if you boot up your computer, it would show this message, your PC is now stoned, legalized marijuana. Didn't do anything else, right? You know, in the, in the pre-internet age, it's pretty hard to imagine how you could use something like this in a, in a more malicious or useful way, right? 
And you know, we don't know who the creator was. We know it was an art, a student from Auckland, sorry, Wellington, New Zealand. But um, beyond that, we, you know, we're not able to ask the person what the purpose of this was. But I mean, clearly, like this is performance art, right? Like this guy was trying to tell us a story, and awakens us to a world of um, vulnerabilities that were opened up by computers that we were in no way prepared for. You know, like I remember when I booted up my computer and saw this. I felt like a visceral shock in my guts of like, you know, what are my parents going to say when they find this here? But, you know, people that had found the same virus on their um, Seagate, uh, factory sealed Seagate hard drives that they bought years later, same thing at laptops from Aldi. You switch on your computer and you see this, it's a vir visceral shock, right? And the shock is that this thing that we used to think, you know, was akin to like a VCR player or a, um, or a calculator or something like that had this whole world of ways that it could be used counter to our will and that we were in no way prepared for. So the next one would be um, PGP, Philip Zimmerman's PGP, and um, you know this was the first um, kind of robust encryption technology which was available to the world. Uh, it was open source. He released it to the world in 1991. Got on the internet, downloaded by people in dozens of countries, and as a consequence, he found himself uh, facing some charges for exporting munitions because at the time, or, uh, robust cryptography was considered to be a munition like tanks, guns, bombs, things like that. So how we got around this was another way he printed the source code of uh, PGP into a book, and you could rip off the covers, scan it with an OCR scanner, uh, compile the source code yourself, and then you had it. And so as a consequence, uh, you know, the idea was simple that, um, you know, uh, that uh, munitions are protected under ITAR, like we talked about before, but um, uh, books are protected under the First Amendment, their freedom of speech. And so this ended up working, and they dropped the case, and as a consequence today, we have access to robust encryption software. But the, what was um, powerful about this was not just PGP, which was good software, but the message and the story of PGP that, um, you know, that, that the rules and regulations, if we understand them, no longer work. They no longer function. We're able to route around them through code, technology, and the internet. And this world of things which were considered to be off, off limits to the average person were now available to us if we could cooperate and work together using these, uh, these tools and these mediums. So the next one would be the Liberator Pistol, and Cody Wilson released this on the internet in 2013, and it was the first kind of 3D printed firearm. And you know, it was a pretty shitty gun, to be quite honest with you, right? You know, like uh, to change the, um, the, the rounds, it was quite hard to extract the casings, uh, had a maximum life of eight shots, and the idea of like homemade firearms is nothing new. People have been doing this for hundreds of years with pipes and bits and pieces and things like that. But this is the first time that anyone could get the factor, fa factory reproducible, if you like, plans delivered anywhere on the internet, and that was something that was different. You know, and Cody himself, he said, you know, it was kind of like a toy gun, a prop gun, but the, the idea was not like whether you could make an AR-15 with a 3D printer, it was the moment of realization when you realized that you could make a gun with a 3D printer, what that did to people's awareness or the potential of technology um, to route around laws, to, to do things which people thought were impossible, to change the, the dynamics of power, the world that we live in today. And indeed, if you look in Myanmar, Right now, the rebels fighting against the um, authoritarian regime in Myanmar, they're using a thing called the FGC-9, which is a gun created by a guy called Jay Stark, who was directly inspired by Cody Wilson and the Liberator to create this thing here. And what that is, is it gives them a real you know, fighting chance, a real tool that they can use to meet the, the government on the battlefield and, and resist them. You know? So the story of the Liberator is very clear, is that, you know, that um, Technology gives you the ability to, to resist and to not simply have to sort of roll over to the, uh, the um, proclamations of governments or corporations. That together, that we can work together to create tools, even as extreme as a firearm, to resist these things and to give us freedom. The last one is uh, the um, Open Pancreas Project. So if you have type 1 diabetes, um, your life is consumed by a constant, uh, the need to make constant choices about um, managing your insulin levels, right? You know, if you have a uh, glucose alarm go off at 3 o'clock in the morning, you've got to pull yourself out of bed, administer some insulin, um, and, and check things out. And the average type 1 diabetic has to make 300 of these decisions every day. So there's two pieces of technologies that really help type 1 diabetics, and they are the insulin pump that administers insulin in a set uh, algorithm, and the uh, glucose monitor, and that monitors the, the glucose levels in their blood and alerts them if you know, something's up. But these two things, they're proprietary technologies. They can't talk to each other. They, they grew apart, and because of medical bureaucracy and, and, and bullshit, more or less, you, know, uh, the, you can't have these two things talk to each other where the glucose monitor will automatically tell the, uh, the pump to administer insulin. 
So in 2014, a bunch of hackers decided that they were going to solve this problem, uh, and they created this thing called the Oatum Pancreas Project. Its slogan is, we are not waiting for, uh, for someone else to make the world a better place. And what they did was they found a, a glucose pump which had a, a, an exploit where you could kind of hack into it and feed it external commands. So they threw together some open source code, a list of parts that you could get together for less than 200 bucks, and uh, they created this um, thing which would allow um, type 1 diabetics not only to be able to automatically administer their insulin based on the feedback of the uh, glucose, uh, sorry, the glucose monitor, but also that allowed them to adjust all the settings of the, of the, um, the insulin pump, you know, depending on their particular body's response or uh, how they acted in certain situations. So, you know, the story of the I mean, pancreas project is like the ones that we looked at before. You know, it's a story of how if the, if the open market or governments do not want to give you what you need to make your life livable. You don't have to just accept this. You can work together with other people and through technology and code, create an alternative that serves you. So these four examples um, are, I think, good examples of how you, software can be, a, can be art, can be like a canvas for you to tell a different story about the role of technology in our life. One where, uh, where innovation and where we devote our time is not driven by the potential to make, um, for those things to make governments or corporations profit, but by human beings working together on things because they find them interesting and meaningful. And that's important because um, all technology is about moving us away from what is natural, right? The course of human history is plotted by the way that human beings have leveraged and utilized technologies to change their relationship with the world around them for the better. And uh, you know, our reliance on and our relationship with that technology is something which differentiates us from all the other animals. It's what makes us fundamentally human. In the world that we live in today, it's impossible to imagine how it could function without uh, as many things as they are being mediated through technology. And that creates a, a sense of reliance on technology, right? You know, where even 100 years ago, you might have one or two innovations that came across along in your lifetime that radically forced you to change the way you did things. Now this is happening every five years or less. And so that creates a reliance where you need to kind of submit to this unrelenting wave of new applications and technologies to be able to keep up with the people around you. But it also creates a sense of helplessness, a sense of atomization, that without um, surrounding through these things and, and using them, you're not able to, to interface and interact with the world around you and those that you love. Without using these technologies that you had no say in designing, no uh, say in what you gave away for their benefits, uh, no awarenesses of the biases that they uh, subtly seek to sow within your mind for the benefits of their creators. Um, and you know, this creates a sense of helplessness, right? A sense that we, we can't go about our life without using these technologies. You know, without the, the full updated version of uh, Tinder, you're unable to find a significant other. Without uh, exaggerating or clout chasing on uh, Twitter, no one cares about your opinion or even knows it exists. Without giving away your personal information to Coinbase, um, you know, it's too hard to figure out how to buy this Bitcoin thing. And soon, without submitting to whatever unconscious biases and selected information AI wants to feed you, you aren't able to keep up and be competitive with the other people who do. Um, and so, you know, this, this, uh, this helplessness and the sense of reliance on technology is really because of another story, a story that society tells us about what is the purpose of technology, that it's a system and not a tool. And these two different views and ways of looking at technology are like the stories that we looked at before. They have a tremendous influence on our actions and therefore how the world around us forms. And the systems view of technology would say that good technologies are these things. They are prescriptive and passive things. That something that you submit to in exchange for receiving a desired outcome. They're like an instruction manual or a recipe. But the tool's view of technology is one that's different. It says that good technologies are descriptive or intentional. It's something that you must learn to wield as an extension of yourself. It's part of the, that is the purpose of the technology, like an instrument. One of them you know, says that you know, what makes a good technology is things that deliver convenience, efficiency, output volume, that minimize risks. The other one says you know, good technologies are things that give the user autonomy, utility, and they maximize their freedom. They force the user to think about why they actually want what they are after. You know, they must learn to wield and to, to make unconscious decisions to use the technology to be able to chase this. And that by understanding these things, we get to the number that really get to the number of the problem rather than just patching over a hole. You know. If you were to sum these up in one sentence, system says that good technologies create predictable outcomes from button presses, whereas uh, good tools foster human community and cooperation and self-understanding. So all technologies are really designed to do one thing, right? To make the difficult easy. And the system's view says that the problem is people. 
that if we remove the influence and input of people into our system, then we get an efficient outcome, and that's how we achieve these things here. But the tools view is the opposite, is that people are the solution, and that the whole point of technologies is to engage people and to allow them to actualize and to understand what they want and why they want it and how they get it. And without that, you know, we're just simply chasing ourselves. And the problem that we have in the world today is that it's the system's view of technology that predominates, right? When, when a new technology comes along, we ask ourselves, how convenient is this? How uh, easy is it to use? Um, you know, how uh, efficient and what's the output volume out of this thing that has? You know, how easily can it allow us to passively consume the options provided to us on a shelf by corporations or governments, rather than giving us autonomy and agency in deciding what those things are? Right. And so um, that th th these two views uh, are, are critical about understanding and, and linking this back to, you know, what does this all have to do with Bitcoin? Well. The, the, the answer is this, is that Bitcoin is a different type of technology, right? You know, its, it's greatest achievement is that it's existed for 14 years now without a revenue stream, without a marketing plan, without a CEO, without a product to sell us, without a subscription service to lock us into. Now, of course, you know, the speculative elephant definitely has something to do with Bitcoin surviving, but you only have to look at altcoins to see that, you know, this is not the only thing that makes it work, right? Why, why Bitcoin succeeds, why it is successful today, is its story. It's a story uh, of why Satoshi created Bitcoin, and it's not to uh, exploit a, a market opportunity or to generate profit. It's a response to a very real human problem. The history of um, fiat currencies is full of governments and banks exploiting them uh, at the expense of the people. And you know, Satoshi's, uh, Satoshi saw Bitcoin as a way to tell a different story, how code could be a canvas, to show how money could be different than what we understand the way things just have to be, that there could be an alternative, and that we could see how technologies could be things that serve us and liberate us. And really, you know, if you look in the world today, you know, this is the only technology that young people are familiar with and deal with on a regular basis that tells them a different story than the technologies that are created by governments or corporations. The only one that doesn't tell them what to think, what they can or what they cannot say, um, doesn't present them a Hobbesian choice of exploitations masquerading as free market choice. And that's because Bitcoin is a fundamentally different technology. Uh, and, it, and it stands against all the, the lessons and the, the stories that society tells us about the purpose, what the purpose of technology actually is, right? You know, if you look at Bitcoin as a system, what is it? It's an incredibly inefficient database uh, with a speculative, uh, narrative-driven asset tack on top, right? But if you look at Bitcoin as a tool, what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is an incredibly efficient idea. It's an idea that can change the world around us by forcing us to re-examine and, and interact through money through a different lens about finance and money and redefining that, that can change our world, right? So, you know, that, that, the power of Bitcoin is that, is that it provides a different narrative to, to the world around us. It's one of the only ones that works and is functioning and that we can say is, you know, this, this system can work, right? It's a thing of the people by the people. It's a system in a world of tools. And I think one of the you know, greatest things or advantages of, of Bitcoin is um, that it already is inspiring other, alterna other alternative technologies of this nature. Nostra, I think, is the first real example you've seen, right? Nostra is built technically and spiritually on the lessons that Bitcoin have taught, has taught over 14 years. We can say categorically that these approaches, not just to, um, as a peer-to-peer -peer way to, to share information around, but also as a way to generate funding to, as developers to, to progress and keep a thing moving. You know, we have real tangible evidence from Bitcoin about how these alternative systems work, right? And to me, that is the real power of Bitcoin, is that it has painted us this alternative story. Social media is a great example of a technology that you know, the powers that be would have you think are bottom-up technologies, right, that allow people to change the world around us, but try and say anything that's remotely controversial or out there on social media, and you'll quickly learn that that is not the case, right? They, they control what, the, uh, what is amplified and what is muffled, right? And it's just a, another tool for to control. Nostra is a great example of us realizing the insanity of building a community on this bird app that incentivizes argumentation and disagreement, you know, ca casino of bad communication, where the house always wins, how we can say, fuck that, we're going to create our own technology that serves us and only us. So, good art makes people uncomfortable. It makes them think, it makes them feel, it challenges their assumptions in ways that words and writing cannot. And painting, music, software, uh, sculpture, whatever, that does not do this, that is not art, that's merely entertainment. 
And if all the art that we have in our, in our lives serves no greater purpose than that, then we lose our ability to articulate and, and to aspire towards something greater than hedon, hedonism or titillation. So the power of art really is to give us the tools to be able to explain and articulate how we can strive towards a better world. And without it, we're just well-entertained worker drones in someone else's system. So it's tempting for people you know, who want Bitcoin to succeed to try and dumb it down, to make it easier, to, to compromise some core principles like self-custody, uh, to try and minimize the exposure of users to volatility, uh, to things like that, right? But um, doing these things, you know, by, if that's how we, uh, if we compromise Bitcoin to, uh, to follow these, uh, to make it easier for these people, right? If we let the co lowest common denominator, if you like, lead the direction of Bitcoin, if that's how we uh, determine how we design the businesses and the software by which people interact with Bitcoin, if that's how we articulate the core principle about what Bitcoin is and why Bitcoin is, then we fail in our core mission, I think, of what Bitcoin is really about, and that's to push these people, to challenge them, to actively engage them and challenge their ideas about the world that they live in today and, and, and the assumptions that we have about money, and to show them a different alternative of the way that human beings can work together to create a different system than the one we currently have. And if we compromise these things you know, for, for good UX because it's more familiar, to bolt on KYC or custodial features and things like that, then we risk not reinventing the financial system, but simply recreating the one we have on Bitcoin, an entertaining asset in the same technological dystopia which we currently inhabit. So principles are important, and Bitcoin doesn't win by trying to be more like a system, more like the things that people understand. All that means is compromising the reasons that it is successful, the reason it is appealing, the reasons that it's winning over and over and over again from the bottom up. So, you know, I think Bitcoin should be a little confusing, a little difficult, right? Because all technologies are about moving away from what is natural. It should be a little confusing because, you know, it's a paradigm shift away from all the lessons that society has told us about the purpose of technology. It should be a little confronting, like if you were told a story which made total sense and rang totally true, but stood against all the stories that have been told about the way the world works. So Bitcoin is not entertainment. It's not a means for you to grow your YouTube channel, to throw a glorified conference that you call a uh, glorified party that you call a conference, uh, to uh, roll out cheap platitudes, to stick it to the man on social media while you go about your otherwise boring conformist life. You know, if this is all Bitcoin is, that's all it aspires to, then we fail in the core thing which has made it successful up to this point. A different story, a different narrative. A shining example of how we can change the world around us from the bottom up, peer to peer. So Bitcoin is performance art. Bitcoin is an object that we can use to tell a story, a different story. Not just uh, sound money, digital gold, unstoppable payments, but a tool in a world of systems. A shining example of how technologies can be used to create alternatives that are not dictated by governments or corporations, that we can choose ourselves to create a better world a world where we don't have to compromise for anyone or anything. Thank you. So I, I, I'd like to challenge you a, a little bit. Challenge away, my friend. <laughs> I, I, so um, on software as art, I think, mm -hmm. that's a, I think that's a pretty well established mm -hmm. uh, um, line of thought and, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it goes into uh, generative art that we have now with NFTs and, and different things and also different actions and, and activities. Um, the, challenge, the, the, the challenge to you, to, to you there mm -hmm. is um, what are the communication tools or what is the communication form to abstract that away for people so that there's a realization? So how do you, how do you exit the platitudes mm -hmm. can, and, the can I, and, and the symbolism of what it is that you're, that I think is solidly established? Um, can, I, can, I re, can I rephrase your question to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying sure. and answer it? Right? What you're saying is, um, if I get you correctly, that people understand the software is art, but like, what is that 
pragmatically mean? Like, what do we, what do we have to do? Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yep. I mean, um, it's a difficult thing to articulate, right? And, and uh, you know, this, this, this speech is, is not a technical speech of directions. It's more like a, an inspiring story about something which I think is quite lacking in the community, and that's an understanding of, like, why. You know, like, sure, this technology works, creates amazing money, but what does the world look like that we create? And, and I think it's very short, tacky, plastic, poorly thought ideas about what that future is, right? And so, to me, the point of art is, is understanding, with art, it's about imagining the future and it's, and it's painting a picture, it's creating a feeling, if you like, right? And I think that many things, um, I would say this as an artist myself, many, many things, you don't need to articulate all the detail with art. It's, it's, you can feel it, you can see it, you, know, you get an idea, you can convey it, but there's also the beauty in that you are not explicit, right? It allows other people to interpret it in different ways, right? So, how did, so I'm curious about mm -hmm. how it is that you, as an artist and as an empath, mm -hmm. um, what are the feelings that you get with two of our narratives right now, artistic narratives that mm -hmm. I think are very, very strong, so solar punk and mm -hmm. lunar punk, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this, this, this utopian and I mean, dystopian ideal, um, both of those sort of movements in mm -hmm. the long line of being punk about something are very, very present in our dialogue right now. How do you personally react viscerally to the art and the narratives that you're seeing from those two movements in our so narrow sphere of of you know, community I would, and culture. Counter your point there in the terms of like, yeah, I mean, I think in this thing, people are aware of, you know, solar punk, lunar punk, but I think if you go out to like, you go to Miami right now, these people don't know what the fuck that is, right? They don't know anything. They have, don't want to you know, de degrade the people there at Miami right now, but, you know, a lot of these people are lacking. I think we can fairly degrade the people <laughs> there right now. There, there's a lot of people that are lacking any soul and culture in their life, right? And without that, as you kind of try to talk about here, like, you know, without that meaning, you don't know where, where you are going. Like, you don't have a compass to, to, to provide you that higher purpose. And as I said, all that you can imagine is titillation and hedonism, right? You know, buy a Lambo, you know, get some big titty bitches or whatever it is. You know, not, not something about, like, like why, let's create a better world, as I see, you know, in the, the talks that I've seen here, you know, about community, about family, about, you know, building a different system and envisioning something which is better in the world that we currently inhabit, right? You know? So, I mean, I think um, the, that loner punk and solar punk are great ideas, and, and they're great examples. Um, but I think kind of what I, I guess I'm speaking it to this is um, maybe it's at cross purposes, is I don't feel like the, the general Bitcoin space has any awareness of this kind of stuff. It's very cheap kind of platitudes and, and very poorly thought out ideas. And um, well, I guess what I was trying to highlight in this is like, like Bitcoin is not just a money, and that seems to be the, the narrative, right? It's money, it's money, money. But what for? Like what is, what, is the, what is the new world we are creating? And that leaks into many things about the way you design. You know, like CoinJoin is a great example, right? Bitcoin does not need to be this thing where the, your wallet selects or your UTXOs, you have some freedom and you, you can envision this thing. In a so, so this is essentially, um, to a certain degree, the argument that Eric Wall and Udi Wertheimer are making with... Dangerous uh, ground here. ...with making Bitcoin fun again and having and the art and, and onboarding people with a different set of narratives mm. that are maybe at conflict with uh, pristine ideas. I think that there is... You know, we're, we, I mean, it's just a distinctive art statement and a, a social uh, movement that you can be critical of or not, but it is, it, it's also the, essentially the argument that they're making. I, I agree. I mean, like, artistic uh, one. It, here's a good example I was thinking about today is like, um, you know, when I got into Bitcoin, uh, the, the first things that really kind of like orange people would be like were Andreas and Tolopoulos' talks, right? And I think to this day, they're some of the best talks that have ever been given to Bitcoin, and, and no one has got remotely close to that, right? Because now we all talk about economics, macro, all this kind of stuff. But you know, what he talked about was very human things, right? People that everyone can relate to, reasons why Bitcoin matters for human beings, right? And I feel like that narrative has you know, kind of really gone out the window, and people aren't aware of how culty and <laughs> how ridiculous they look to the outside, because most people don't give a shit about this stuff, right? They give a shit about human things, right? And if you can talk a human language, people understand and they get it. But the more you're talking about like macro and inflation and things like that, I mean, I, th I think it's interesting, a larger audience than you would think. But there's a lot of apathy in, in, in the reactions to that was essentially, you know, where I was coming from. Mm. Um, so I don't want to occupy uh, the time here because we do have more minutes. Uh, does anybody have a question? You're right. Not sure about the question, but I really liked your talk, and uh, I'm very happy that someone. So, uh, parallel police triangle is science, technology, and art. I don't know if many people know uh, what the logo means, and I feel that the 
art part hasn't been clearly represented, but I wanted to say that uh, Paralnipolis itself started as an art project by an art group. I, many people don't know this. And uh, to me, as a, as a founder of, uh, uh, of Paralnipolis also in Bratislava, uh, the key to that art is um, that when you enter outside, when you enter the building, you feel a little bit uneasy. That's the emotion it, it creates. It's, you know, um, in cafeteria, you know, they play Creative Commons music, which is a very weird sounding music. There is a lot of 3D printed stuff. You only can pay with weird money. You know, there's not a bar with a barista behind, but you can walk around. And you kind of enter this space and uh, are looking ar around, and it makes you uneasy. And I think what it does is uh, it uh, forces uh, uh, the people to open their minds, and uh, that allows them to understand, you know, Bitcoin volatility. Because without this push, without this light opening of the mind, mind it will not work because mm -hmm. they will ask, okay, so what is this? You know, when will I get rich? I don't claim that it works so well, but it's at least a filter for uh, people who refuse to open their mind. So um, I suggest uh, people, when you go there and walk around, uh, try to look at it uh, as an art project uh, with this specific purpose, I would say. Uh, again, I, I'm not saying it works or uh, that it is like that right now, but in the beginning, um, that was certainly the feeling, at, at least for me. So I, I really, uh, I think it relates very much to what you were if, saying, and th th me, thank you for, for that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, 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 would, I would totally agree in that. I think the problem that we have is, like, y y people want people to get Bitcoin, right? They want to, like, share. It's like kind of like evangelist gospel or whatever, you know? And, and so you say to people, what is Bitcoin? And they say, well, it's, it's like this, right? It's like Salma, it's like digital gold, it's like this or whatever. And of course, you know, Bitcoin is its own thing, right? It's not like any of these kind of things. And people do themselves a disservice when they package it as this. You know, I think you see exchanges, right? The UX is obviously like, well, people, this is money, it's finance, so let's make this like a bank, right? You know, and follow the similar flows because you want to get people on board. But the, the risk that I, that I feel, I guess, you know, what this whole talk is about is that again, you know, is, is recreating the existing system on Bitcoin, is that people are afraid and they, they're not willing to, like, kind of take a stand about certain things where, um, you know, self-custodial -cust wallets is one that's been kind of in the Twitter dialogue a while, you know. I think there's a certain case, maybe not everywhere, but a certain case where people would say, you know, we, we refuse your service if you do not use Bitcoin this way, right? Because if you, people don't have a standard, they don't have principles about, like, hey, we could help you here, but we're not interested in being your customer for this reason, for ideological reasons. Then, you know, where, where Bitcoin goes culturally, um, you know, is, is a scary place. You know, it's great technology, but if no one is running a node and it's only run by big corporations, then Bitcoin is captured, right? And there's many examples. If you take that one example and expand it out to the behavior of people, if people don't use Bitcoin in a sovereign way, if it's all living on exchanges and no one takes custody of it, does it really have the properties that we think of as a value? No, it doesn't, right? So there's a cultural lesson to be taught, and it's hard because you want to like get these people on board, and Bitcoin's fucking confusing, right? You know, like for new people, it's, it's hard enough as it is. But I guess what I'm getting at is like that it's it's important to realize this is performance art. It's a demonstration. You're trying to not just like show people a technology. You're trying to teach them a different story about how the world can and should work. And if we do that at a service, if we try and make it too easy or too simple, right? I'm going to get very, very cultural and very, very personal with you then. About that. Very well. <laughs> um, so um, there's a long standing uh, alternative narrative on the continent of Australia mm -hmm. and in the Pacific Islands, okay? And we're in a time of, of, of climate change. It's a process that's been going on since the Earth. I mean, we're living through that and interpreting it through the lens of our narratives and stories that it is that we're telling ourselves about what that actually means and how much of a role it is that we play in that. How much of your own personal culture coming from there mm -hmm. would you say prepared you literally personally, you know, mm -hmm. for 
the alternative narrative and the alternative world building that you find inside of cryptocurrency? Oh, massively. I mean, like for me, I think a bigger one than geographically, geography is like the fact that I play in a crazy death metal band, right? You know, and so you have exposure to like different subcultures and how people get clicky and do stupid things and also how people, you have something that you understand is very passionate to you, but people don't get it, right? You play them the song, I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? Turn it off, right? You know, they, they can't understand where you're coming from and it's, it's a hard message to articulate. Um, so, I mean, I think a bit, a bit of that, if you're talking about New Zealand, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very communal kind of culture and I feel, uh, this is <laughs> another talk which I'm probably gonna give in, in September. I, I guess I'll give a little preview of what I'm gonna say is, I think one of the biggest problems in the space is people envision the way that we communicate Bitcoin and how it succeeds, the models that we use are businesses, right? You know, it's like, let's take what works in tech and do it in Bitcoin. My counterpoint is I think religion is a better one, right? You know, I think models that work for like know, missionaries or people that go out there and spread this stuff, that's more ideologically in line with what we are actually doing with this thing, what we're actually trying to sell, right? And so um, I, I think if you're talking about different parts of the world, I feel like America has a very strong business culture and that's how they project it. And it's very much aggressive, numbers, 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 push people into the thing, you know, we'll figure out the details later. And the, the problem with Bitcoin is uh, sometimes figuring out the details later if you're painting yourself in too much of a hole can be a very big problem, right? Can, can be the game over, right? So. so I'm personally very excited about the crackdown. Uh, <laughs> that America is doing on, mm -hmm. on crypto and Bitcoin. Um, I sort of come from the camp of, yeah, fuck American leadership in just about every possible way. Why would we want to have American business leadership in Bitcoin when American business leadership in fiat and commodities and weaponry and everything mm -hmm. has brought it to where it is right now? I can't, you know, so I, I think that this allows for an opening mm -hmm. for other cultures and other, other players on the planet. And it's the best possible thing for Bitcoin if it's really fucked in America, mm -hmm. is, my, is my personal uh, You know, I, I agree, and, and I don't want to poo-poo Americans, because, you know, they're, they're very... Yeah, so they have a, a very personal good thing. It's just an, ethic, it's a... And, and I think a lot of why Bitcoin is where it is today is because of American hard work. But at the same time, like, their culture because a lot of the businesses and money comes out of America, has a very strong influence on how Bitcoin is, right? Like the biggest one is like taxes, right? Americans are fucking afraid of spending a dollar on Bitcoin because of capital gains or something, right? You know? And I think a lot of the reason we have this like hodl mania is because Americans are so fucking afraid to spend one dollar of lightning on, on uh, something, you know? And the IRS is nothing to be barked at, right? I'm not trying to put these people down, but I think it's an example of like how American views on things have a tremendous influence on our on our ecosystem, and if if uh, you didn't have some of these things, it was like you know, it, using Bitcoin in transa for transacting wasn't all this hadn't have all this tech shit with it. I think we'd have a very different ecosystem than we have now. So, so it's an example of. I mean, I agree with you. I think it's great, not in the terms of like you know, for Americans it sucks, but I think like Bitcoin is not American, dude. It's like Waltz. It's 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 for everyone, and it needs to have the input of the whole world for it to work for the whole world. And I do feel like at the moment it has a very a bit of an American-centric narrative, and that it would be better if we had more input from other people around the world. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, so I think we'll close that.